Welcome everyone. I know people are just coming in. Feel free to put your name and your organization and maybe where you're located in the chat. And that way um, we can just see who else is here um, or you can see each other who's here. Um, I know we can't really see you in this webinar format, but that can be a nice way. It's not a bit, we're not expecting a big group, um, but we are recording the webinar so that we can put it on our website for others to view later. We'll just give it a minute or two and then get started. Great, thank you for starting the introductions. I didn't know I could have two different, I can have the participant window and the chat window up at the same time. <laughs> Learning a new thing. Great, for those of you who just joined us, yeah, just add your name and your organization, maybe location in the chat. We can see who's here and we'll we'll get started in a second or maybe i'll just introduce myself and then that way because that'll give us a minute and uh then i'll introduce leslie so i'm laura lee i'm the director of grant making at the maine community foundation um i help oversee our competitive grant programs um help to uh you know try to help us do best practices across all the grant programs and and um, and offering this information webinar actually is one of them to try to make sure that we are being as um, transparent as possible and giving you access to the information that you might need um, well ahead of the uh, deadline for applications. Um, so this is for the main expansion arts grant program. And I will be turning it over to Leslie Good, who's our senior program officer who manages this program and many other things. Um, and Leslie um, will do a, you know, go through the presentation. Um, I will be um, looking at the chat. And so if you have a really simple, straightforward question um, in the chat, I will try to answer that. Um, if it's um, if I'm not able to do that, um, or if you know that it's a little bit more complicated question, then um, hold off and you could actually use the raise hand function. Just click that. And once Leslie's done, we will go through all of the raised hands in order and unmute you so you can ask your question and we can we can hear you back and forth. So that's how we'll We'll handle that and I will turn it over to Leslie. Thanks, Laura, and um, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. As Laura said, my name is Leslie Good. I am a senior program officer based in the Ellsworth office at the Maine Community Foundation, although I'm in Blue Hill today at home and uh, working from Blue Hill. And um, yeah, so I, I staff a couple of the arts programs at the Maine Community Foundation, and in terms of geography, I also cover Hancock, Washington, and Waldo counties. So this is um, the Maine Expansion Arts Program actually is one of the oldest grant programs of the, com the Community Foundation. Um, it was started in 1987 with a gift from the National Endowment from the Arts. As you can imagine over the years, the focus and the criteria have been modified, but the essential purpose has remained the same. And that's to, as you can see here, support arts organizations and arts programs in Maine, serving rural communities and BIPOC communities, and really intended to expand access to the arts in areas that might have limited access. That was the purpose um, of the initial funds from the National Endowment for the Arts, and that continues to be the focus of the program. 
we're very, we were very fortunate. Um, some of you may have read or heard last year in 2021, received a very substantial gift, very generous gift from Mackenzie Scott and her husband, Dan Jewett, to add to the endowment um, of the main expansion arts program. So that has enabled us to broaden the criteria to um, last year, one of the first things that we did historically, the maximum award had been $5,000. So we were able to increase the maximum award to $10,000 and make some of the other changes, um, you know, that I'll talk more about in a minute. I'll talk a little bit, you know, it's part of the purpose of, um, one of the purposes of having the webinar today is to talk about some of the ways that we've been able to expand this program with the additional funds we received. And I just wanna um, highlight the photo. I love this photo. It might be a familiar photo to you, um, to some of you from the gem, which is a gem of a project in Bethel. This is a project that we have supported a couple of times through Maine Expansion Arts, as well as some of the other competitive grant programs at the Maine Community Foundation. And it's just, first of all, I think it's just such a beautiful photo in terms of like the energy and creativity that really um, resonates from it. And it also is a really nice example of the purpose of the Maine Expansion Arts Program. So this is a mural that the community came together to design and paint during COVID to brighten up their facility, as well as just really engage people who maybe had never picked up a paintbrush um, to be part of this community arts project. So I feel like that's really the heart and soul of, um, of Maine Expansion Arts. And we love and appreciate all the work that all of you do. Um, so a little background, as I said, about the Expansion Arts Program. Here are some of the statistics um, from last year. We received 34 applications, um, a little over $280,000 requested. We were able to award 17 grants um, for a total of almost 140,000. As I said, it used to be our maximum award was five. We increased it to 10 with that large gift we received in 2021. So our average award has jumped up. And like so many of, or of the other competitive grant programs that we have at the Maine Community Foundation, one of the real advantages of applying to our competitive grant programs is that it puts your application in front of what we call our donor advised funds. So we have donors who are interested in certain kinds of geography or certain kinds of focus areas, you know, whatever it might be as varied as individuals and families are, um, who look at what comes, the applications that come in through our competitive grants program and oftentimes they'll, they'll fund them directly. So they'll learn about your work, support your work. We love it because it extends our grant budget supports your work and they love it because it gives them an opportunity to, to learn about organizations and work they might not otherwise have access to. Um, one other thing I'll say about this, this 17 out of 34 is, is um, what we sort of hope for at the Maine Community Foundation. We know it takes a lot of time and work to write grant applications. It's a competitive process. We don't want it to be too discouraging. So we really aim um, to create our criteria so that somewhere between a third and half of the applications we receive are successful. So it's nice to see numbers like this where a lot of the meritorious work um, that's proposed actually can be supported. So uh, going back to the expansion arts program specifically, as I said, from the time it began, it's always had this dual focus, um, both for rural as well as for BIPOC to expand access to the arts. And one of the things that we were able to do also with this gift we received last year is it used to be that we really had focused our funding on what we call project grants, new or expanding projects which I'm sure is familiar to most of you in the nonprofit community. With the additional support um, funding, we can now offer what we call general support grants. And I'll talk some more specifically about how we, um, how we define that for both the rural and, slight, and for the BIPOC focus of this program. But essentially general support, as you might expect, means essentially an unrestricted grant to organizations that are exclusively focused on the arts. And we've included the project option because we know there are lots of organizations doing terrific work in the community 
with an arts focus who don't necessarily have their sole mission focused on the arts. So we wanna create opportunities for organizations that are offering arts programs or projects to be able to access the main expansion arts funding as well as arts organizations. So that's why we, we've maintained um, both the project as well as the general support options for both rural as well as BIPOC. And as I mentioned, the maximum award is now $10,000 for a one year duration. Um, you all know better than we do that in the era of COVID planning is really, really difficult. Things slip, staff turnover, all different kinds of things. So if you need an extension, um, we're always happy to talk about that. So I mentioned that just because I know sometimes folks will look at that one year duration and think, oh, you know, does that timing fit with what I have? So we encourage you to apply um, with your best of intentions. And if your best of intentions don't pan out, we can always talk about it down the road. So again, this comes back to the general criteria related to the main community foundation, not necessarily just main expansion arts. We don't fund retrospectively. We can only fund prospective expenses. So in this case for main expansion arts, the award letters and checks go out in mid-November. So we recommend that your funding, what you propose to fund doesn't, um, and no expenses are incurred before December 1. Um, we can't fund religious activities, endowments, scholarships, camperships, annual appeals, capital expenses. Also, I don't see on this slide, but capital expenses aren't something that we can support either. Um, regranting to through a, a secondary competitive process and political campaigns and lobbying aren't things that we can support. So to focus on the rural aspect of main expansion arts first, because this is an area that really hasn't changed other than the maximum award. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, it's intended to, pro, um, to provide expanded access to the arts in rural communities in Maine. One of the criteria that we use um, is an annual operating budget below $250,000 a year, and that's for expenses in the most recent year. Um, it can be a little complicated how that's defined, and so we ask you, it certainly doesn't have to be an audited budget, but if it's a prospective budget or a retrospective budget, however, you know, whatever your, your, you know, some people work off a calendar year or June 30, you know, um, lots of variations. So we're really just looking for something that will give us a picture of the financial health of your organization. So do, and I think in the application, it's pretty straightforward, um, you know, to do your best with with that, and if you have questions as you're working on the application, feel free to call me. I'll include my phone number as well as my email address on the final slide so you, um, to encourage folks to reach out. The reason that we have this maximum annual budget is because we're focusing on small organizations. And so this is our way of trying to define the universe of what's a small arts organization or a small um, a small organization offering arts programming. And so as you can imagine, with that $250,000 budget cap, we can't um, fund school or school districts. Um, and it breaks my heart. Every year we do get a couple, so you're going to see where I emphasize in a couple of places where um, for main expansion arts, unlike some of our other competitive grant programs at the Community Foundation, schools and school districts are not eligible for a main expansion arts grant, whether it's rural or BIPOC. Um, so the priorities within the rural focus of main expansion arts is to develop and promote the arts of, of that community using local artisan resources. And we, we, we have that um, criteria specified because there is such a rich tradition of arts and artists in Maine. And we're really looking for folks to support, um, to support the arts and, and Maine artists. That's a big part of the, the focus of this funding. So rather than bringing people in from outside the state to do the work, whether it's teaching or other kinds of programs, we really encourage and emphasize um, using main artists and uh, main resources. 
I've mentioned before the focus and that's part of where the $250,000 um, budget limit comes in is underserved geographic areas or people artistically underserved. Um, and then this next one, cooperate and coordinate with other organizations and programs, again, um, is really about the community engagement, which I mentioned in the beginning with that photo from the gem in, in Bethel. You know, it's this idea, this isn't an MFA program, we're not judging the merit or the artistic aesthetic quality of the work, we're really looking for community engagement and expanding access to arts, creativity, energy, that sort of a thing. So it's, this is sort of an extension of, we want a sense of community engagement, um, or you know, we want you to demonstrate in your applications that there is this sense of community engagement and this sort of, you know, the way we talk about it sometimes internally at the Community Foundation is kind of nothing about us with nothing about us without us, you know, sort of that old mantra from, from AIDS activism days being, being brought forward. Um, this idea that the design um, demonstrating the need, you know, those kinds of things, and, you know, are, are involving the community who's going to be served um, as, as part of the process. And then this last piece, um, another way of demonstrating community support is either financial or in kind. And again, we know for a lot of small organizations, there isn't necessarily a cash transfer as a demonstration of support, but there's lots of other ways that, that, um, that people support or there's ways to demonstrate that kind of support. So whether it's volunteers or um, people for providing free space, you know, social media help, whatever it might be, something that gives the reviewers a sense of there really are kind of, you know, there's a lot of energy and there are a lot of folks who are behind this idea. It isn't somebody sitting at their kitchen table by themselves coming up with a, oh, I have a great idea. I'm going to write a grant to support it by myself. So as I mentioned a minute ago, for both rural as well as the BIPOC grants, we offer general operating support, but only to organizations whose sole mission is focused on the arts. Um, one of the things that we've heard consistently and we've heard even more loudly during COVID is that um, nonprofits you know, really need unrestricted funds. Um, staffing, keeping the lights on, all the rest of it, coming up with new projects and new ideas um, isn't necessarily as high a priority as just keeping the organization going. And again, particularly in the area of COVID. So for organizations whose sole mission, as you can read here, is focused on the arts, we are offering general operating support. Um, and as I mentioned a moment ago, because we also want to encourage and support artistic work that comes through organizations who have a mission broader than just the arts, we're continuing to offer project grants. So if you have a program or a project that involves or serves a rural community, even if you aren't specifically an arts organization, um, if you're a you know, community center or something of that sort, we've supported, uh, we've made grants to, um, to nursing homes so that they can do arts projects with, um, with their residents and staff, you know, any number of things where, as I say, it's not necessarily an arts organization, but it's definitely expanding access to the arts um, in, in rural communities that have limited access. Um, <laughs> and I'll say again, please don't apply for a rural grant if you have an operating budget over 250,000, because we're just gonna have to screen it out. And that's, you know, that's always an unfortunate occurrence. Um, so now I'll move on to the BIPOC grant criteria. And one thing I will say is that we've lifted the $250,000 maximum um, budget, annual budget. That does not apply for the next series of, of slides I'll talk about related to our BIPOC um, grant options. Other ways that this track is very similar to the rural track is it's intended to serve BIPOC people and communities in Maine. So again, all of this is focused on Maine, um, expanding access to the arts. And for this, um, for this one, we have a couple of ways of thinking about it. So we have the general support grants and the project grants like we do for rural. And so for 
general support grants, the following three criteria, all of them must be met and for a project only one. And I can talk in a minute about the thinking behind that. So the way we define and think about a BIPOC organization or a BIPOC project is that there are people, BIPOC people in leadership positions on the board or staff of the organization in the design, delivery and evaluation of the program or services. And as most of the participants are intended recipients. So for a general support grant, a BIPOC organization would have to meet all of these in addition to being an arts organization. And in the same way that we realize there are other kinds of organizations that, that have arts projects and we want to support those, we recognize there are white-led organizations that support BIPOC arts and artists. And we want to create space to encourage and support that as well. So that's why for white led or non necessarily, not necessarily BIPOC organizations, at least one of these have, one of these three criteria have to be met so that there is an indication that this has a BIPOC focus to the project. And actually this photo from the Hudson Museum is a nice example of that. So this is a grant that we made last year to support Wabanaki basket making tools. So the Hudson Museum, as you can imagine, is not exclusive, you know, is not a BIPOC organization. It is a white led organization, but they're engaging and supporting Wabanaki artists. And that's something that we're happy to support through Maine Expansion Arts. So that would be an example of a project grant. We can talk more about that if there are questions. So um, very similar to the priorities for the rural grants, the BIPOC grants, we want to develop and promote the arts of BIPOC communities and traditions and, and artists and resources. And in this case, it can be within Maine or outside. So if there are specific traditions or um, you know, we, we understand that there may not necessarily be all the resources or all of the skilled crafts people or artists within Maine. So for a BIPOC project, if it's necessary for that particular tradition or that particular kind of project to bring someone in from outside Maine to help um, with the work or as an educator, something of that sort, we want, um, we'll, we'll fund that in a way that we wouldn't necessarily in the right in the rural track um, and then these next two are identical to the rural track where we're looking for community engagement cooperation and coordination with other organizations and programs and a demonstration of community support whether that's um, financial cash related or a demonstration of volunteer or other kinds of in-kind support And again, uh, exactly the same as the rural grants, we have general support or unrestricted grants to only to BIPOC led organizations who ex whose exclusive mission is focused on the arts. And then we have project grants to either BIPOC led organizations or BIPOC focused projects that promote BIPOC arts and artists. So that goes back to that slide I showed a moment ago with those three definitions um, where the project grants would need to meet at least one and the general support would need to meet all three. So in terms of timing, um, and this applies to both the BIPOC as well as the rural, it's a single program. So the, the time frame um, is, is identical. Um, the webinar today is to help you prepare for submitting an application by September 15th. Um, we'll internally do some due diligence, clean, do some cleanup and so forth of those applications. Take, that usually takes a week or two. Get the applications out to our external reviewers by the end of September. Allow them um, time in October to do their reviews and send us their recommendations. We'll have a grant decision-making meeting in November. 
Award letters and checks will go out in early to mid-November and by email. So one thing I will emphasize, and we'll see it when I get to the next couple of slides about how to apply. So it's really important that the email that you use when you apply is something that you check because that's how you're going to receive notification of whether your application was successful or not. Um, you won't, uh, you won't necessarily receive a, a paper letter. We are also this year piloting something new for Maine Expansion Arts, where we're having um, multiple reviewers for a single application. It used to be we just had one external reviewer read and score an application. We want to try what does it, um, how does it change the process? How does it change? Um, you know, sort of how does it how does it change our sense of of the review process to have multiple reviewers look at a single application and then and then try and um, uh, you know try try and merge some of those scores? Is there more objectivity that comes through with multiple lenses looking at a certain app, a single application? So we're um, we'd love to have external reviewers participate in that. It's going to be all, all of the work will be done online. We're going to have um, an orientation and training, as you can see here on October 3rd, for folks who do um, offer to help us with that. And uh, if you're interested, uh, we'd love to hear from you before September 12th. Um, you can go online to the Maine Community Foundation website. This is the direct link, but if you go to the homepage, you'll see where there's an option to get to this link as well. And you can always get in touch with me if you can't locate it and you're interested in participating as a reviewer. Um, if you haven't applied to the Maine Community Foundation before, I'll just quickly show you what it looks like to do that. If you have applied, this should look, I hope, very familiar to you. If you go to the Bay Community Foundation's homepage, this is what you'll see. Maybe the photo will have changed from a winter scene to a summer scene, I think, at this point. But you'll see in this upper right-hand corner the yellow button that says Apply. And you'll click on that, which will take you to this screen. You'll click on apply here and it will take you to this screen. So if you have applied before, you'll log in. If you haven't, we'll ask you to register. And that's where I say it's gonna you know, ask you for just some basic contact information for yourself and your organization. Really emphasize the importance of having an email that's something um, you're gonna look at because that's the way you'll stay connected to the application. Um, it's a really, this is an online system that's designed by the same folks who designed SurveyMonkey, so most folks find it really quite intuitive. Um, if you have trouble with it, there are, you can go back and forth, you can, um, there are options to get in touch with us if you have questions. Um, you can save your work and come back to it, you can share your work with another colleague. Um, we've found that it's really a pretty nice and user-friendly system. We hope that you find that to be the case as well. So I think that's it in terms of what I had hoped to cover today. Um, thank you all for your interest and for joining us. Um, this is my contact information if you want to get in touch with me directly at any point um, to talk about an idea. But as Laura said, I'm happy uh, we're both happy to take questions if anybody has any questions before we close out today that we can help with. Thanks, Leslie. Um, there were a couple of questions that I very briefly answered in the chat. Um, so I don't know if, so one of them came from Homer and I don't know if you wanna talk, um, you can do the raised hand function if you do, but basically was asking about um, how we define rural. Um, and I did say that we do not have a strict definition. So that's why I thought I would let you just speak <laughs> briefly um, on, on how we might be looking at what is rural. Yeah, that's a great question. And it, as Laura said, it's a question that we have gone around on internally, the review committee, we asked, we've asked them, um, 
how do you define rural? Should we have a definition of rural in writing? And oh, hold on just a second. Homer raised his hand. So let me allow, allow him okay. to talk to just in case there's more to that. All right. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Great. So I work with Meeting House Arts in Freeport. Um, and obviously Freeport wouldn't really be considered rural. Um, but we also serve Durham and Pownall. Um, and I just kind of was wondering if um, even though we're kind of based in Freeport, do those two locations kind of count as rural? And would this be a good um, grant for us to apply for? Yeah, so that's a great lead into exactly why the reviewers historically have said, we don't want to put a definition of rural in writing because it would exclude a place like Freeport. But if the work is focused in Durham, Pownall areas that are considered rural, then that fits the definition. So I think it comes back to what's the focus, you know, the, the, the intent is to expand access to the arts in areas with limited access. Um, so I, you know, that's the situation where Durham and rural or Durham and Palmo rather fit that criteria, even if Freeport doesn't. So we don't necessarily want to exclude an organization whose mailing address or physical um, location is in a place like Freeport um, if the intended audience and recipients um, or folks who would be engaged would be in a more rural community. So it would be expanding access where there's limited access to the arts. Great, thank you so much. Yeah, yeah, but that's a great question. <laughs> we, just okay. go round, we go round and round on that one. Yeah, I was gonna say, we could talk for a long time about yeah, that. Exactly. So I'm glad that you had a specific question, Homer, that we yeah, could Yeah, you know, I mean, cause we get these funny, you know, situations sometimes too, well, like Hallowell, is Hallowell rural? And it's sort of like, well, it depends in what context you're talking about Hallowell. I mean, it's right, it is, it is and it isn't, but. Um, yeah, so most of Maine think, meets some kind of federal yeah, definition. Yeah, yeah of rural, exactly, so. exactly. So it's a Maine definition of rural for sure, not a federal definition of rural. Yeah. And then I think really bringing it back to expanding access to the arts where there's limited access is the real is the real um, linchpin for for this particular program. Great. Okay, I will move on to Starsha has a hand raised. So hold on just a sec. Let me. Oh, whoops. Hello? Yes, go ahead. Hi, so I'm, I'm representing Sarsha. She's my director. Oh. Um, my, name, my name is uh, Brooke and I'm with Gateway Community Service. It's like a BIPOC led organization. Um, and specifically I direct the uh, Youth Coalition, which is run by immigrant black and brown youth. Um, and I was wondering, so, we're most we're based out of Portland and Lewiston, which I would argue are not rural, but Maine in general is rural, like you just said. Um, but because we're a BIPOC organization and we're trying to get children into the arts who don't normally have access to it, does that would that qualify or? Yeah, that so you would be applying through the BIPOC track. Yes. Right. Yeah. And the, right. Exactly. So. So applying for a grant related through the BIPOC track is is for any part of Maine. The, the rural criteria oh, yeah. doesn't. Yeah, sorry if I didn't make that clear. Those are two no, kind of distinct. Did. Yeah, yeah. So definitely, yeah. The 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 urban, <laughs> however you define rural in Maine, doesn't apply <laughs> for, for BIPOC <laughs> organizations or for folks who are applying for a BIPOC project grant we you know like the Hudson Museum would be a nice example up in you know Bangor or Orono area yeah you know, probably not rural but because it's it's a BIPOC focused work um, it, it, meets the, it meets the other criteria of the main expansion arts but Gateway would need to apply for a project grant because Gateway is not solely focused on the arts that's so. right it, but That's because right. it's a BIPOC organization, it would go into the BIPOC track, but it would you would need to apply for a project grant. 
Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so, exactly. so for example, it sounds like you're, you're doing arts, want to do some arts programming with youth. That would be a really nice fit for the, for a BIPOC project or program grant, as Laura says. Yeah. Great. And then let's see, Julie had a question that, um, about sort of project versus general support grant for a rural arts organization. Julie, do you want to talk about that more? Well, I thought I allowed her to talk. OK, can you hear me now? Yeah. OK, um, thank you for taking my question. Um, we're talking about a specific project that we would we're expanding our programming and expanding access to the arts for kids in rural areas, which is, even though we are solely a an arts organization, it's an it's an. What's the organization, Julie? It's Art Waves. Okay. On and um, we've been trying to think creatively how to get kids who wouldn't necessarily be able to participate in the same kinds of after school programming that some of their more affluent peers might be able to and how can we do that and how can we connect kids to artists in areas that their particular art teachers aren't in. So it is a very specific project that that answers all the criteria. And we're an arts organization so maybe we should be applying for a general support grant i'm just trying to figure it out. Yeah, I think in your case, you'd have the option of applying for either general support or a project grant. Um, so that would really be an internal decision. The general support is going to give you greater flexibility in terms of, you know, the fewer restrictions on how you use the funds. Um, so, yeah, that's probably more of a conversation that you all would want to have internally of what's the best fit for your current year priorities. Great. But you Thank could you. apply for either. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thanks. I said probably general only because <laughs> who wouldn't want more flexibility? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, but yes, you right. Either one could work. Okay. So I don't see any more raised hands. Does anybody else have a question? I'll give you a few seconds to raise your hand so we can see you. There's no requirement that we like go on forever. Just answer all the questions or until, <laughs> one, until one, I mean. <laughs> Just wanna make sure we answer everybody's questions. And Leslie has her contact information up there. So if for some reason, you know, a question comes to you or you're thinking about a specific proposal, you know, you should absolutely feel free to um, reach out to her. And, and as Laura, I think, mentioned in the beginning, this is being recorded and it will be posted on the website. So for anybody who's listening to the recording, of course, you're very welcome to reach out directly as well. Yeah. And if also, if anybody knows people who you think might be interested or good for um, the proposal reviewer um, a volunteer opportunity, you know, please like let, let those that you know about that so that... Um, we're just trying to spread the word on that. Okay, well, I don't see anything more. So thank you so much for um, taking some time out of your day to join us and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks, Bye. everyone. Bye-bye.